And, uh, but we have the PowerPoint slides up, so we can go through that. Uh, like I said, I wanted to go through live markets with you because we could take some of the principles I want to show you and apply them to what's happening right now. So, but we'll, we'll sort it out. You know, as in life, it's not what happens, it's just how you deal with it, right? Pardon? We're not going to see live market. That's the one piece here I'm missing, which I'm really bummed about. It was working here, but not interfacing well with this system. So for whatever reason, hmm. you know, it's the green button, right? Yeah, the big green one. You know, it's not working for me. Oh, no, I mean the green button's not working. Oh, okay. He holds the power. So whatever he decides, that's what we'll do. That's not it. Okay. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's not the problem. Problem is you have the wrong since it's not available at this moment. But it's, I was going to look at fundamentals. We're going to look at commodity currencies, what they represent, and then also intermarket relationships. You know, when we look at, you know, gold, S&P, crude oil, how do they compare to other markets? Do they have a correlation to other currencies? If we start with fundamentals, let's just talk about that for a minute. I think fundamentals are important because they create the beliefs of people who are trading that market, right? You and I hear a, a positive fundamental, we expect prices to do a certain thing. And you ready? Okay. Hold on one sec here.
presentation today went well, but we're just waiting for it to boot up. Not yet. Okay. All right. So, anyways, we're talking about fundamentals. You'll see see a slide about this in just a few minutes, and uh, the the principles when it comes to fundamentals. I look at it from the point of view of it creating expectations about a market. That's what a fundamental trader trades on, the expectation of how other people are going to react to the market. So if, the bullish, if we have a bullish number, the expectation is everybody's going to say that's a bullish number and they're going to buy it. But you and I see situations where we have a bullish number but the market's going down. And we were talking about that on the break, in fact. The issue is, if we're looking at a bullish fundamental expectation, it's not the only piece of information coming out that day. So I think that's one of the challenges if you and I strictly trade off of a fundamental report. The fact is that it's competing with other information that's out there. So to say that bullish, that number's bullish, I want to be a buyer. From my point of view, I would say that number's bullish and if the market's going down, I'm a seller. Because I want to trade how the market absorbs the information, not the information itself. And I think that's important. Because price puts money in our pocket and price takes money out of our pocket. So that's why for me, the final determination of a trade is price information which we're going to take a look at here in just a little bit. I want to show you a, my interpretation of a technique that you might find helpful. Also, I, I break down fundamental information. You know, we have fundamentals that are expected, that we expect to see. We have fundamentals, and so we're looking for a certain market reaction. We know the first Friday of the month is unemployment, for example. Those are certain rhythms that we see in the market. We also have market information that is unexpected, that we just didn't see coming. I call it shock fundamentals that we couldn't anticipate. Uh, that's also why I think risk management is so critical, because those happen probably less than 2% of the time, but we do have those situations. We also, I break it down to another category called anticipatory fundamentals. It's where a market moves on the anticipation of a future event. And you'll hear it say, well, you know, the expectation is the central bank will do so and so, so and so, and the market's now reacting to this. But it hasn't happened yet. So it's anticipating a potential. You know, when you see a market reacting that way to the anticipation of fundamental information, here's where the hazard comes into play. Let's say this what would be something else, maybe besides currencies. Uh, if we look at, uh, how about soybeans? If in the, I live in Chicago, in the Midwest part of the United States, the first couple weeks of August are critical for uh, soybeans in terms of growth. If in the middle of July, the US Weather Bureau says, uh, right now we think we'll have drought conditions, Soybean prices move up. Now, are soybean prices higher because we don't have enough soybeans? No, we haven't harvested them yet. Who knows how many soybeans we have? That means when you see a market moving on anticipation, on the anticipation what a central bank will do if you and I are looking at currencies, I want a tight stop. Because that market could come down as fast as it went up. If we get rain the first couple of weeks of August, those soybean prices are coming right down. So when I look at something like that, I want to be sensitive to is what's driving it. Is it an anticipation of a future event? Or is it economic reality? Has the central bank just made an announcement and they've done a certain thing? Have we just gotten the rain, or, or let's say we haven't gotten the rain, and soybean prices are moving higher because we don't have enough soybeans? So that kind of trend, where it's a, a market reality trend, I want a loose stop because chances are this could mature further. So I don't want to have a tight stop. I want to give it a little bit more room. So that would be another way I would look at fundamental information. 
that I think it's really important for us in terms of interpreting. How are we doing on the PowerPoint? Is that that come up? Mark? It's, no? Still thinking. Still thinking, okay. Uh, another aspect, as I mentioned to you before about commodity currencies, let's talk about what a commodity currency is. Are everyone familiar with that or not familiar with commodity currencies? Let me tell you where that comes from. It comes from countries that are dependent upon selling their resources. So examples, the most common examples of commodity currencies would be Canadian dollar, our friends in Australia, and our friends in New Zealand. Those are countries whose wealth or their GDP is dependent upon them selling to other countries. And it becomes a commodity currency because as those other countries buy those commodities that that country sells, it puts demand on that currency because they have to convert their local currency to that currency. So if I'm going to buy something from Australia, I need to convert U.S. dollars to Australian dollars to buy their goods. So if you're seeing a country that is dependent upon that kind of relationship, uh, it's oftentimes tied closely to a particular market. Let's talk about Canada. Canada, you know, we're the largest buyer of crude oil from Canada, uh, although that's going down. Right now, the United States, we are exporting more than we're importing when it comes to crude oil. We're really very close to energy independent. But anyways, we buy crude oil from Canada. So if crude oil prices are, let's say, moving up a little bit, we would expect the Canadian dollar also probably to track with that because of demand to buy that Canadian crude oil. So it puts demand on that Canadian dollar. We expect it to go higher. If we talk about Australia, uh, Australia, if you look at gold, for example, that's a common one for them. I have some charts that hopefully we'll look at in just a few minutes that show you a picture of what we're talking about. Uh, so if you talk about Australia, their customers that you want to be aware of is China, is the number one customer of Australia, Japan's number two, we're number three, and Korea's number four. So our, our demand on the Australian dollar has an impact on its pricing. So if you look at gold, for example, that's one of their major exports. As gold prices change, we'll also expect to see the Aussie dollar change. Uh, if you look at iron ore, that's a market that's also traded. That's also fairly correlated to what we expect to see for um, Australian dollars. So it, it, those commodity currencies, the other, actually since we're talking about Australia, the other issue I'd like to talk to you about are uh, interest rate trades, carry trades. And what those represent, if your path hasn't crossed that, it's taking advantage of, or trying to take advantage of, the interest rate differentials between countries. Currencies are one of the tools that reflect that. So for example, if you and I could borrow money in Japan and pay 0.25 interest on that loan, take that money, convert it to Australian dollars, go to Australia, put it in the savings account, and we could make two and a quarter percent. So our interest rate cost out of Japan is a quarter of a percent. We're getting two and a quarter in Australia, and for just putting the money in the bank, we're going to have net two percent, right? That would be a carry trade. Now the challenge is this. Let's say you and I take a 90-day loan in Japan. We pay a quarter of a percent and it's a million uh, dollars, or million yen. If we now go to Australia, we convert that million yen to Australian dollars, put it in the bank, we wait 90 days, we take that money, Australian dollars, convert it back to Japanese yen, and we go back to Japan, pay off our loan, and now we got that interest rate differential. But what is the weak part of this concept? It's what? Well, that's right. If we, if we look at what happens with the, the exchange rate, 
If the Australian dollar becomes weaker against Japanese yen, it means we get less yen. In fact, we may get such a small amount we can't pay our loan off and we don't get any interest. So the issue with that, if you ever hear anybody talk about a carry trade, what they do is they hedge that uh, Australian dollar exposure so that if the Australian dollar gets weaker against the yen, they can take advantage of that in the marketplace. So they have that to offset that weakness. So when you hear people talk about the carry trade as being unwound, and that's why you're seeing people selling Australian dollars and Japanese yen is going up. Uh, when you hear people talk about that, this is what they're referring to. You know, there's some banks they deal with in Canada that does what you and I are talking about. You know, money managers, uh, there's a group in Germany I can think of that they look at the world like you and I look at stocks, for example. We have a portfolio of stocks, right, that you and I pick. Well, they have a portfolio and it's countries. And one of the things they look at in those countries is the interest rate. Just like you and I would if we went to different banks to say, which one's gonna pay me the most? And the same thing happens there with these money managers. And so this interest rate component of currencies is really a critical part. And so you wanna be sensitive to that. The carry trades is an important component of the whole prospect of how currencies trade. It's one more important variable that has an impact on it. Um, I was gonna show you the, uh, how are we doing on that PowerPoint? Oh, okay. Excuse me one second, because then we're ready to rock and roll. This All righty. So, interest rates, important component for currencies. The relationship of these commodity currencies to the underlying markets. Canadian dollar, crude oil. Uh, it, the issue with, with uh, crude oil, by the way, let's talk about that in terms of dollars, in terms of currencies. Uh, the crude oil is traded in U.S. dollars. It's the world's largest commodity market. So imagine you're a country that produces crude oil. Your sensitivity to currency rates is very high, right? Because I get paid in US dollars. I now go to my bank and take those US dollars and turn it into my currency. And if the US dollar is weak, I get less of my currency. So one of the factors that comes into play when it comes to U.S. dollars is if U.S. dollar is stronger, one of the variables is we expect lower crude oil prices. If you see lower crude oil prices, uh, then it may imply something about the U.S. dollar. If on the other hand, crude oil prices or U.S. dollar is stronger instead of being weaker, if it's weaker, we expect higher crude oil prices. If it's stronger, we expect lower crude oil prices. And that, that's a very common relationship we've seen for a long time. And, and on the energy front, something to keep in mind too is when we see energy 
moving, let's say moving up, we see all the refiners and all those stocks move up too, right? Because we expect their profit margins to go up. But at some point, when crude oil prices get high enough, other companies are gonna say, you know, my cost of energy to run my manufacturing operation is getting so high, my profit margin is really shrinking. So watch crude oil in terms of US dollar, that has an impact on it. In terms of supply, global supply, I'm very bearish on crude oil, actually. We have a lot of supply globally. Uh, and um, as I mentioned, the US dollar can have an impact on it. Uh, we have a lot of supply in the world right now to meet oil demand. We have three pipelines coming from the Permian find in Texas that's coming online this year. That'll add three million barrels of crude oil to our production. We'll be producing over 15 million barrels a day, the largest of any country in the world. So when you hear about shortages, it's, it's that perception idea when it comes to fundamentals. The perception is that it's gonna be tight, that there's not gonna be enough. But I think the reality is uh, this year before we finish, that's not going to be the situation. Now, let's take a look, maybe, at... Can I click? Oh, it is working. All right, good. Oh, just to give you a little of my background, I, I come from the floors in, bless you, I come from the floors in Chicago. Uh, so I started with stock options, moved over to futures. So my thinking about the market, just from a floor point of view, uh, that's how I think about it. Uh, the agenda, as I mentioned, fundamental drivers, intermarket relationship uh, prices. Fundamental, we talked about expectations and anticipatory fundamentals, uh, stock fundamentals, shock fundamentals, and also reality. Those are the areas that we talked about. Just we're going to review a few of these things quickly. As we know that the things that have impact on interest uh, FX that we want to pay attention to, interest rates like we talked about, the economics of a country, the politics, geopolitical events, Federal Reserve actions, uh, and uncertainties. Those are all the fundamental drivers that we see having an impact that you and I want to monitor. So we had the panel earlier and people are talking about things that they look at. These are some of the areas that you'd want to spend some attention to to see what is happening because it does have an impact on uh, currency prices. Relationship here between the Euro S&P 500 crude oil and gold. Here's what I'd like you to focus when you see these kind of charts. This chart, if you're not familiar with it, is a uh, percent change chart. There, okay, you can see that. Let me, let me go over here. Uh, this percent change chart, it means that what you're looking at, this is all these markets are brought to zero. And what we're seeing is how they move compared to each other percentage-wise. Now, when you see these kind of comparisons, here's what you want your eye to do. When you look at this, you want to look at do the peaks and the valleys match up? Do the peaks you see on the top match with peaks on the bottom? If it does, it tells us that there's something about the rhythm between these markets that we're seeing unfolding. That's why those become so important for us. The other thing we could look at, let me go back here for a minute. The other thing we could look at here is the timing of it. Is there particular, are there particular times that we see the peaks and valley occurring? Do these markets move in the same direction all the time? You know, if I make a fundamental assumption about the relationship between these markets, in fact, let me give you an example here. Let's look at, let's take a quick look at, what is the blue line there is crude oil. And the green line on top is the S&P 500. And we can see crude oil prices were going lower. And I mentioned to you about the connection of crude oil prices and the U.S. dollar. I said if the U.S. dollar is stronger, then crude oil prices may get weaker. All right, now look at the relationship between the euro. The euro is this black line. Do you see that black line? All right, look at this point right here. Crude oil prices are going down. The euro is going down. So if the euro is going down, it means the dollar is getting stronger. 
So that relationship through that period of time was holding true. That'd be a typical relationship. These charts become important for you and I because if I'm gonna make that assumption about the US dollar and crude oil, then I wanna see if that's true now. Right? Does that economic relationship always ring true? No. Does it ring true once in a while? Yes. And we see a period here where it did. So these charts, when you see these percent change charts, it's important to keep that in mind. You want to look at, this is Australian dollar in gold. I mentioned that's one of the things that you and I could look at when it comes to that marketplace. So again, what you and I want to look at, do the peaks and the valleys match up? And they seem to have a tendency to kind of move similar to each other, don't they? What you also want to look for is when those peaks and valleys do not match up, it tells us that one market is leading or lagging another market. Let's say that we, let's say that right here in um, the Australian dollar, when it bottomed out, if gold is getting stronger before the Australian dollar is, do gold prices give us an indicator that there may be a change in the Aussie dollar? So they become important in terms of do they match up, and if they don't match up, it can tell us about a lead lag effect. Typically in the past, many years ago, I used to look at this, and it would be about a three-week delay. If you saw a change in gold, about three weeks later, you'd see the change in the Aussie dollar. I don't know why that was, but it was. We don't see that anymore today, but it's these relationships I think it's worth you and I looking at. And if we take a look at another one here, we have the Canadian dollar and crude oil. We are talking about our friends in Canada and crude oil prices. Uh, gives you a feel for do they move at the same rate. Now, percentage-wise, you can see that what we're looking down here at uh, crude oil prices, they're pretty volatile compared to the Canadian dollar. But if you look at the peaks and valleys, they kind of match up also in this chart. So that's one of the reasons why it becomes another barometer for us to look at. And again, that's a commodity currency that we're looking at there. Uh, when we're trading 24-hour markets, you know, we want to be aware that when we are trading it, we want to look at that reaction to news. There's things that are important here. I'm just going to put them all up here in case you want to take a picture of it. But when you look at time zones, what I look at is, for example, how much does this currency move in the Asian time zone, typically? How much does it move in the European time zone, typically? How much does it move in the US time zone, typically? So that when I wake up and I see what Asia has done, maybe nothing unusual, but I look at Europe and I see Europe, this thing has moved twice the normal range that we would see, then I have some expectation about the day session here in the United States. We also get to see how the market absorbs information around the clock. So does it get stronger? Does it get weaker? How is it reacting to those pieces of information? So a few things that I think is helpful for us to take advantage of when we think about a 24-hour market. And these are a few of those ideas that I think can be helpful. Uh, also, when it comes to reacting to 24-hour information, this is the Brexit vote. I thought we could take a quick look at that. Uh, this is what the ETF looked like, SPY, a very liquid ETF, by the way. That's the S&P 500. The euro dollar chart looks exactly the same. The other presentation we weren't able to pull up has the euro dollar in there. But the euro dollar is going to look similar to this. And what you're seeing here in, that, in the futures market, because they trade 24 hours a day, we don't see all the gaps and things that you see over here uh, in SPY. Now, let me show you another one here. I'd like to show you the intraday chart. This is where that 24 hour comes into play for you and me. I'm showing you the S&P 500. This could be the euro. It would look very similar to this. Did you remember they had the vote? June 23rd, 2016. And I have to tell you, I went home long. Uh, I, I want to clarify that. I did have a level right down here to sell that market if it did go lower because we didn't know what was going to happen. Because they did the votes. 
and now they're collecting the votes. And then U.S. market opens up, and they're collecting the votes there. They still didn't know the answer. In Asia, that's what you're looking at. This is how I look at it. U.S., Asia, Europe, U.S. Asia time zone is when they said, holy, Toledo, it passed. Brexit could occur. And that's what you're seeing here. That all occurred in the Asia time zone and in Europe. That's the other part of this right here, too. So we have that kind of event, and we got one coming up here. Uh, we have a, a vote that may be coming up here. But uh, when you look at that kind of thing, when you have a, a large international event, you want to be sensitive to how the market absorbs that information. And that's what we're looking at here, just to give you an idea. You know, more than half the aggregate world exports are dominated in dollars. And more than 80% of all international currency transfers occur in dollars. So it, it's a major input for us. This is what I call behavioral candles. And uh, I'm just going to put it up here. It's, this is something I learned in Tokyo uh, at Bank of America. I was there to teach another course on another technique. And a part of the course was to deal, uh, was to uh, put trades on in US treasuries. So I went into the dealing room, put some trades on. I'm walking out, and I see a fellow sitting at a big table with a big piece of paper. And he was drawing daily and weekly candle charts. And I said to Kuno-san, the general I was with, I said, Kuno-san, what are these? And he goes, oh, these are Japanese candle charts. Now, as many of you know, there's about 80 candle patterns that you and I can talk about. I don't, I have nothing against it, and I'm happy to talk about it, but I don't do that. Uh, because who remembers number one by the time you get to number 80 is the tricky bit. And what do you do with them? But here's something I think that you and I can extract from it. And if, you know, we have more time later on, I'd be happy to go over it with you. But I think the body of the candle, if, if it's green and they, we have a higher close, it represents buyers. If it's red, it represents selling. A shadow on the top represents sellers, and a shadow on the bottom represents buyers. The next time you look at a candle chart, think about those parameters. The size of the body is a measure of enthusiasm. The size of the shadow is a measure of rejection. Do we see big shadows on top, or do we see no shadows? all gives us a clue about how a market's unfolding and how it's trading. Um, so, oh, and I, you know, I got to finish. Uh, uh, this is just, a, a, it's a website. It's uh, my website. It's free. You can click right here where it says uh, start here. You want to click on that. Uh, that's, uh, that's a video that looks like this that explains uh, what I'm doing. What you're going to see in the video, I do it every day, and it covers 22 markets. Um, I extract some information from each one. So anyways, you go down here, it says, click where it says uh, you know, start, and then you click on that. And right there, it says uh, registration. You just put in some basic information. It stays there. It's not used for anything. It doesn't go any place, but that's where it sits. And then uh, you could sign in and, and take a look at those videos if you think that would be helpful. The idea behind it is to show how someone's analyzing the markets. What I wanted to show you with the live markets is to show you my, for me, I'm not making trade recommendations, but for me, my buy and sell levels in these currencies and in these other markets. Um, but we're not going to be able to do that today. Maybe another time. So the intent behind it is you can see how someone's analyzing these markets. And um, it's free, so it's the right price in that regard. Uh, but it's just another tool to give you a reference of how are these currencies trading. I look at six different pairs in the currencies, the Euro, uh, Swissy, uh, Japanese Yen, and uh, Aussie dollar, Canadian dollar, and Bitcoin. So that'll give you an idea of what's available there. And with that, we're going to have to stop to stay on schedule.